Ukraine confounded military experts and pundits in 2022, firstly by surviving and then by pushing the Russian army back from thousands of square kilometers of its territory. Politicians and pundits around the world had urged Ukraine to offer concessions in order to secure a peace settlement with Russia. Giving up territory in the east or pledging to remain neutral would, in their view, have saved Ukrainian lives and reduced the risk of Russian aggression or even nuclear strike. But Ukrainians are in no mood to train land for concessions for a fragile or temporary peace. It's doubtful, too, whether anything the West or Ukraine could have done short of total capitulation would have satisfied Putin. But now Ukraine has shown extraordinary strength, resilience and success on the battlefields. It raises the question as to what sort of settlement would be acceptable to Ukrainians and whether they may have to cede some territory or sovereignty to end the violence. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please like and subscribe if you like our guest speakers, as it helps other people to discover the fantastic content that we uh, create. Uh, and of course, it helps us to find many other Ukrainian experts and voices, which you may not hear on the mainstream media. Marnie Howlett is a departmental lecturer in Russian and East European politics in the Department of Politics and International Relations and Oxford School of Global Area Studies. She is also an associate member of St Anthony's and Nuffield Colleges. Marnie's research lies at the nexus of geopolitics, cartography, borders and nationalism within the former Soviet Union, particularly Ukraine. She has conducted extensive fieldwork in the country, analysing the role of borders in shaping grassroots dynamics. Since the beginning of the Russia-Ukraine war, she has been working on several projects related to Ukrainian nation building at the grassroots, including running public opinion and conjoint experiment surveys in the country. Her main research interests also include the use of digital, visual and spatial methods for political research. Now, I heard you speak in an event earlier this year, uh, and it was an extraordinary lineup of speakers. But what you had to say, I thought was absolutely gripping. And I'm delighted to be able to sort of share uh, that with the audience today. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Now, if you could give a bit of background to your research, because, you know, some of your insights um, aren't just born out of sort of, you know, historic analysis, etc. But you actually deal with a lot of data, a lot of survey data uh, on changing attitudes and opinions. Um, so I'd love to, to have a bit of a description of uh, of your research and how it works. Yeah, well, I guess if I'm going to talk about my research. I almost need to preface it, which um I guess to emphasize that there are sort of two bodies of work in which I research at the current time, one being pre-invasion and one sort of being post-invasion. Uh, so I'm a qualitative scholar, predominantly an ethnographer. Uh, so much of my doctoral research and the work that I am and have been working on for several years is based at grassroots sentiments. Um, I've lived in the country for more than a year of my life. I traveled around the country, specifically uh, living in borderland areas, so that areas nearest to Russia and uh, Belarus's border in Chernihiv Oblast, uh, in the center of the country in Kivohrad Oblast, as well as in Zakarpatia, a region that borders four countries uh, with the Soviet or with the European Union. Sorry. However, since the 24th of February, uh, that work um, that I'd been doing um, and had been up to that time uh, working on and really devoting my life to, unfortunately, I um, had to stop. I wasn't able to continue that research uh, except to work with the data that I'd gathered. So in the last year, I have switched and become more of a quantitative scholar, perhaps a more mixed method uh, a scholar uh, in running um, a public opinion survey, which we ran in May 2022. Uh, then we ran a conjoint survey experiment in July 2022. To, and I'm about um, to send off another uh, experiment in the country uh, within the next couple of weeks. So with this, um, I sort of have the qualitative elements, um, but also I've been exploring some of the quantitative um, public opinion views. And this is just because methodologically, unfortunately, we're not able uh, to be in the country in the ways that uh, we would. But in terms of topic, I mean, I'm sure you're curious <laughs> what I'm interested in. 
Uh, so I'm interested in fundamentally grassroots sentiments um, and how people see themselves and their country geopolitically uh, within space. Um, Ukraine uh, historically uh, has been seen as a borderland between the East and the West uh, in the contemporary day between the European Union and Russia. Um, we can also conceptualize Ukraine as a borderland of Russia, which Russia arguably does right now, uh, and at the same time, um, a borderland of the West. Some scholars have even called it a buffer zone or even and maybe a bloodland, which we do see very much today. Uh, but in my own research, I really try to push back against all of these narratives, um, as I believe that that undermines the agency of the country. Um, it undermines the agency of Ukrainians most fundamentally. Uh, so a book that I'm just finishing up and days away from submitting to the publisher is literally exactly about that, is about challenging this narrative. Um, both, I guess, accusing the East and the West of, you know, undermining Ukraine, of denying its agency, its sovereignty, its autonomy, um, by seeing it as an extension of something rather than um, an independent entity uh, that plays a significant role in geopolitics. Mm -hmm. um, my research was leading up to the invasion, but I think, if anything, the invasion underscores um, this and really shows that this is true. It is an, an autonomous state. And the data that I've been able to gather since the invasion only, you know, underscores this and emphasizes even further. And I think that even those of us who are not studying the region can see uh, that Ukraine is very much an, a sovereign, independent state, uh, and it will be seen as such going forward. And I think what's interesting about that and that concept of denying agency and imposing points of view on Ukraine, it also fails to acknowledge that the country changes as in a process of flux as well. So the sort of views in one era in 1991 are going to be different from those in the early 2000s, going to be different prior to 19, uh, 2014, and going to be substantially different to today. And it's based on, on, on experience and also the evolution and change in society. Um, and it seems to me that the the propaganda you get from from Russia and Vatnik doesn't acknowledge that evolution is possible, uh, but also sometimes the imposed Western points of view also don't acknowledge that you, Ukraine, you know, may may not always feel uh, uh, the same, uh, or may not even feel how how you know we think they feel. I think that's a fantastic point. Um, I think for a very long time we've been treated, especially in the West, we've treated Ukraine as an extension of Russia. And linguistically, this can be demonstrated by the fact that many people still call Ukraine the Ukraine. Using that article with the Ukraine actually undermines its sovereignty and says it is a republic of another country. It is not an independent sovereign territory. I mean, it's grammatically incorrect. Um, however, this still continues to be used, which dates back to the Ukrainian Socialist Republic, which makes sense but it also says that we haven't much or not all of us but much of the west hasn't come to terms with the fact that ukraine is uh, an independent state um with this even caveating that is that it's not only english and german slovak polish and czech all also use some sort of article when talking about it when translated into English, the word Ukraine actually means edge or borderland. So therefore, adding the the actually suggests the borderland, right? And so linguistically, how we talk about it just denies its sovereignty. It shows a political position, even implicitly, and even if that's not our intention, you know, through the ways that we speak about this. Again, this is not even talking about the Russian side, because they do it same uh, in this in a similar way by adding na um, Ukraine when talking about the country, again, translates to um, on the borderland, um, rather than saying, in Ukraine as a country. So I do fundamentally agree that the ways we talk about the country, we approach the country, even within my discipline of political science, many people hadn't been studying the country because it wasn't seen to be you know, the sexiest country to study is always about Russia, everything circled around Russia, then Georgia for a while, and more lately, Belarus, there have been some of us working on the country, but many of the Soviet or the former Soviet republics have been considerably understudied. Again, Ukraine's not alone here. I mean, Moldova, for example, Azerbaijan, or also other examples of countries that we haven't been looking at. But because the emphasis has continued to be on Russia, and then the others as sort of that extension of, um, and the politics there didn't matter as much until now where we can see that they very much do matter. Um, and if we had been looking at this in this way, I believe we would have been able to realize you know, the discrepancies, but um, the nuances, the, the complexities that existed within Ukraine um, all throughout the country, uh, rather than approaching it as a borderland or even you know, that internal East versus West dichotomy within the country, we very much simplified it to something that is not true. Um, and we know, and many scholars have documented, 
since 2014, you know, this East versus West split by the Nipro uh, is a fallacy and it hasn't been proven to be true since 2014, but arguably even before that. But yet we still continue to stay. And if you read most of the media coming out of Ukraine now, there's still kind of premises itself on the fact that there is this East versus West divide between mm -hmm. the country and why we're so surprised that you know, the East has defended itself so strongly. Well, if we had actually realized what the country was like in the contemporary day, this would not be a surprise to us at all. And there's a lot of other nuances which we can unpack uh, later later in the conversation. And of course, you know, the influence of Russia and the importing of populations or driving populations out of areas will, of course, change the, the makeup of those views or driving the young people out of an area who are uh, don't see, you know, prospects who may... Um, be more aligned with the sort of Western uh, sort of Ukrainian identity and old generations which may hark back to more of a Soviet one. There are so many different nuances to unpack, including, I would call it almost label it ethnic cleansing uh, in, in, in Donbass and Crimea. Um, but this idea of, of Ukraine as a borderland, and as you say, it's implicit in the name, you know, people on the edge uh, or, or the edge kind of country. Um, and then you have the, the the term which sort of originally meant foreigner, but is applied to German now. And that's, uh, the, you know, Nancy, people who are dumb, people who can't speak. And that almost tells you about the mental geography of Russia. There's us, there's this like weird edge, and then there's just like stupid people or people we don't understand or inconsequential. And, uh, and in some ways, the, the Nazi labeling that we now see, it almost goes back to that extremely sort of, primitive uh mental geography of the world doesn't it yeah no very much so and i mean this is what i'm interested in and i'm interested in uncovering these spatial imaginaries or mental geographies if you will and this is what i've done in my own work by giving people maps of contemporary ukraine and contemporary eastern europe and asking them to draw the borders of their country so i've done this in three different regions as i previously mentioned um, but it's quite interesting because especially the regions uh on the edge of Ukraine or in the borderland areas, how people reproduce or produce, I guess, the, the borders of their country actually replicate old historical boundary lines. So in Chernia, for example, often people will reference Dadodubshna, an area, a historical area of Ukraine that has been un, with, been located within Belarus and Russia for many, many years, same with Khursk, as well as Kuban. These areas were uh, taken by Russia many, many years ago, and even during, the, they were never part of Ukraine while it was part of the Soviet Union. Yet these areas are still in the historical memory of Ukrainians. Ironically, it's not Ukraine who is fighting to get these lands back. It is, you know, the other way around. But this at least tells us why Ukrainians are defending themselves so strongly. They have continued to have areas taken from them, lands that they believe belong to them. Um, and now all that they have left is the 1991 version of Ukraine. Uh, therefore, they're going to defend what they have because it's continued to be taken from them. Uh, in this, um, while we don't have the data, and it would be challenging to get at this time, unfortunately, is we can assume that within Russia's spatial imaginary or Russian spatial imaginary would be Ukraine. And we, we can see this. Um, but empirically to get that data to do a similar exercise where we got Russians to draw the maps, I think it would be considerably interesting and tell us a lot about politics, but also in terms of any sort of peace agreement, understanding you know which lands we are fighting over and how we can some sort come to some sort of conclusion about them would lead um, to some sort of peace agreement or at least tell us about what the conflict might look like going forward, you know if there ever would be an end to it. And that 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 that's an interesting area because it also, is not just about identity it's also about the political architecture sort of more organic fluid societies like ukraine that doesn't try to impose a single monolithic point of view on people and of course you've got um you know the russian propaganda machine and it would be fascinating wouldn't it to see how far that propagandistic interpretation of borderlands actually permeate percolates down to people or whether they have you know more complex independent ways of thinking about these I mean, from my own research, being in both urban and rural areas, I know that uh, especially near the borders of Russia and Belarus, um, you know, that propaganda is there. In many cases, people living in rural communities near Russia, sort of all along the borderline, um, not just within Chernia, but um, all the way around, um, they do only have access to Belarusian or Ukrainian, or sorry, Belarusian or Russian media. So with this, you know, it is hard for Ukrainian 
media sources to access these people. They've been trying and they've been fighting this sort of propaganda machine for many years. However, unfortunately, you have generations of people who grew up in the Soviet Union and who have continued to be influenced by sort of similar Soviet ideologies um, in the contemporary day. Many of these people don't have access to other news sources, don't have you know, the ability to travel, to engage with the West in any way, um, or to travel within even internally within Ukraine. And so you do have people who have bought into this narrative. Um, and even, I mean, even prior to the pandemic, this is a concern of many Ukrainians across the country of ways in which they could you know, push back against sort of Russia's propaganda machine that has been there for 20 plus years, right? This is not new. This is something that has slowly been seeping into Ukraine. Um, I think the challenge with this too is that in 1991, you also had a population that didn't really know who they were. They didn't really understand themselves as a state or feel any allegiance to any state in particular. So with having any information, of course, you're going to believe it um, and unden undeniably so. But with that comes its own challenge of ha how we can hack, so to say, these views, regardless of either, regardless if they want to be part of Russia um, or not, is just the fact that they have been able to you know, buy into these narratives to support that regime because that's the only information they have been given. I know in particular, um, young people um, have sort of moved away from this, especially in the contemporary day. Once uh, the EU offered uh, visa-free mobility to Ukrainians, you did see the changing views of young people. Many would go abroad. Previously, many would go to Russia or Belarus to work. Now many, many are leaving, but that also comes with its own challenges, a brain drain, um, difficulties of unifying families and uh, yeah just fundamentally major issues that come with that i mean on propaganda i mean there's so much we could talk about this could be a whole this I mean, could a whole be several though. episodes well yeah. the diaspora is an interesting angle we we didn't sort of put that in our tentative list of questions but actually it's critical isn't it because putin may have felt that if you look at the number of ukrainians that have sort of gone abroad over since 1991 they've had a huge um actual sort of loss of population uh, in some respects you know you could interpret that as people having less commitment to the country and uh, millions and millions have gone abroad and yet now in the wartime situation it's been seen that many of those abroad are hugely involved in civic society. They're very involved in their adopted countries, whether it be Canada, UK, wherever. And now they are reconnecting with, if if they even lost that connection, and then they may, may not have lost that connection, but they're reconnecting with Ukraine. And the diaspora is providing huge momentum and support. Um, in a sense, they still feel that the future of Ukraine and the ownership of Ukraine, they have some responsibility for. And that is in stark contrast to most Russians who won't sort of layer on too much interpretation. But those who have left because they did not want to be drafted or for economic reasons, you do not get that same sense of responsibility, ownership or flowering of civil society. There are many, many reasons for that. And I don't want to be sort of too judgmental about it. But there's a stark difference between the diasporas of the two countries. I am. So, I mean, speaking as someone from the diaspora of the uh, Ukraine, of the Ukrainian diaspora from Canada, I think a lot of this also comes to the fact that Ukraine, throughout its entire history, from the Kievan Rus, has continued to face contestation, um, annexation societal trauma disputes over borders, over land, over population, as different administrations and regimes have tried to control the land that is Ukraine and its people. So because of this, you've continuously had people fleeing the country for better lives elsewhere, um, as well as from poverty, from famine, um, and from other um, forms of suppression. So with this, you have a very large diaspora all around the world in the way that I don't think you know, all countries do. And this is um, unfortunately by nature of continuously being um, sought after or sought to, to be controlled by um, other administrations. So with this, you have this very large diaspora. And even um, since the 24th of February, you've had people who are part of the diaspora who haven't felt attached to their country suddenly feel this new attachment to their country in a way that they probably wouldn't have had there been this um as full scale of the invasion as we've seen. Um, the war did start in 2014 and we didn't see the same attachment, but it really has been um, through the use of social media, as you mentioned even previously, and some of, I'm sure some of your speakers on this on this um, platform will talk about, is a way that we're able to use social media to 
appeal to emotion, to appeal to this population abroad, uh, whether they be closely connected um, or whether their relatives le left the country hundreds of years ago, um, in the case of my own did. Um, but I think there is this connection when you see and been able to be part of this conflict, even though you're living abroad. Uh, for Russians, many of them haven't left. Like while they are dispersed throughout the former Soviet republics, there was a sense of ambiguity when the Soviet Union collapsed as to where the Russian homeland was um, in the fact that they saw the whole Soviet Union as their homeland. And suddenly they were now minorities in countries and trying to figure out who they were was a challenge. And this is something we don't really talk overtly about is that and I don't want to give the sympathy or turn the, the attention away from Ukrainians here, but I think there is you know, an elephant in the room of the fact that Russians are also struggling to figure out who they are. We talk about how Ukrainians didn't know until the 24th of February, and regardless of whether or not that's true or not, Russians really haven't known who they are. And they're, they've been a, almost a fake allegiance to a state or a forced upon allegiance that they must feel. Um, and now I think we see this, the fact that so many Russians have fled when they are being asked to defend their country or to fight for their country, instead you see them fleeing the country, really shows that they are not the ones or they do not feel the same allegiance in a way that Ukrainians have. And again, perhaps this comes through conflict is where allegiance lies. Um, but I think it is an important um, topic to consider that many of us haven't been talking about because we, we do, and I it des deservedly so, are putting the attention on Ukrainians. And that, again, is just unpacks so many ideas to explore. And one thing I've come to realize as we've done a few episodes on cultural appropriation, we've we've done one on sort of NAFO memes, we've done one on Ukrainian humor and this incredibly sort of dark humor. Um, uh, but also, you know, whenever I speak to Ukrainians, there's a sort of rationality and control there. Even when you're angry about something, injustice, even when you're, you know, terribly torn apart by what's happening there has always been able to have a completely i would call it sort of rational and politically uh, sort of philosophical conversation about things which is extraordinary in the current circumstances and i don't want to sort of label russians being opposite that because i've got some, some you know speakers who of course are not like that at all but it seems that having these kind of detached political conversations um has been something that the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union and Putin's regime have been at pains to stop people from thinking and behaving rationally or grouping together uh, and behaving as a sort of, you know, class or group kind of consciousness. And I think it's 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 much more difficult for, for, for Russians to detach and actually think in these more more abstract terms. But also talking about identity. Something else from the cultural appropriation and understanding that, uh, you know, so many cultural uh, figures who have always been thought of as Russian were actually had Ukrainian origins and had far more complex origin stories and influences. It seems to me that as we go on this process of sort of discovery, Ukrainians may lose part of their Russian identity, but what they're gaining is innovative, is new, is is is, is something uh, greater than what they lost. Whereas Russians, as you say, are faced with losing part of that sort of Ukrainian contribution to either the empire and the Soviet Union. And their overall identity is is weakened as a shadow of its former self when you subtract Ukraine from it. I think this, yeah, you're spot on. I think this goes a little bit back to the idea of the spatial imaginary. So not only are you losing, you know, geographically, you're losing a significant portion. If we see Ukraine as being the largest country in Europe, geographically, you're losing a lot of land. Not that Russia needs any more land, and, but the fact is you're losing, you know, that aspect of it. But with that, if you see Ukrainians um, and Belarusians, arguably, as an extension of, you know, Russia, as Putin's famous essay say, says, they're, you know, they're united by some brotherhood, they are the same people, or whatever, whatever he writes. I mean, it's not untrue that there are similarities between the three cultures and between the three languages. Um, although Ukraine is, Ukrainian is a lot closer to Belarusian than it either are to Russian, but also they're closer to any other uh, Slavic language. And I think you know, that's a nuance that's not often talked about. But with that, I think um, we need to realize that the loss of Ukraine is much is significant, is almost much more significant 
then Ukraine's independence is to Ukrainians because Ukrainians already know that they're independent. They recognize what they're fighting for is for the international system or for the global order to realize that they are independent. But for Russia, the loss of Ukraine is the loss of the empire. Even though the empire did die, the empire has been gone, the union has been gone since 1991, this fundamentally embodies, it represents the collapse and it, it is over. And so no leader wants to be the leader in charge of the union who lost you know, its greatest ally in some ways, assuming that they see Ukraine in such a way. Uh, for Ukrainians, they haven't seen Russia like that, especially in the last 30 years, if not even before. Um, and so with that, their loss of losing Russia means nothing to Ukraine. Ukrainians had lost that years ago and they've moved away when they're trying to move further away. And I think this is something that is really important for us to realize, um, especially at the grassroots. While we might not have realized this um, as the outside world or as Westerners who were not familiar with Ukraine, Ukrainians have felt this um, for many, many years, especially those within Western Ukraine. They did not feel attached to Russia in any way since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, yes, they had been under the same political system previously, but with that, they had their own unique culture and identity um, and cultural artifacts, um, you know, figures, symbols, et cetera, that were different from Russia. Um, and even though, that, again, now we see this on our social media, we realize what these are. They were important to Ukrainians before the Soviet Union, um, during and now after. And I think that is something really to emphasize and for your listeners to realize is that Ukrainians had a culture. It was not the same as Russia's, even though Russia suggested and perhaps the Western world assumed they were the same. They were, in fact, different. They were just suppressed uh, by the colonizer. And is is local identity also important in this? Because... Um you know getting to know you know more ukrainians and there's distinct there's you know the lviv identity there's the luhansk identity there's the zaporizhia identity and there's 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 local identities which add another layer of sort of complexity um to to the sort of emerging national identity and i think when you read russian literature you get a sense from say you know turgenev's hunter sketches and so on that that did have local identities to an extent in the Russian Empire. You could be an Oriol man, or you could be somewhere from northern Russia or Krasnoyarsk or wherever, and you would have had distinct local identities based on, you know, food, um, what kind of agriculture, uh, styles of, uh, you know, construction of villages or whatever. There would have been cultural nuances um, that uh, I think provide a bulwark against, you know, absolutism. And yet what we see in Russia is these monolithic identities being post, imposed on people and not just in a propagandist sense. You know, we see that the Soviet Union and I think modern Russia to an extent as well um, does not put any emphasis on, on local identity or division of identity and seeks to erase it uh, where it can. Yeah, I think, I mean, Ukraine at the local level is extremely complex. Um, you know, in the contemporary day, the state is bordered by seven countries. Uh, that is you know, quite a rarity in the world. I think there's only uh, right around, I have it somewhere, I think it's about 25 countries in the world that are bordered by that many countries. With that comes, you know, seven different countries' influences, not just Russia, right? And we always focus on Russia, we focus on Belarus, but there are, you know, four EU countries that also border Ukraine and have significant influences in the contemporary day, but also historically. So parts of Ukraine, especially the region of Zakarpatia, which I study, fell under the Austrian-Hungarian Empire for many, many years. It didn't join the Soviet Union until the 50s. It, because of that, it has not ever really felt attached to Russia by any means. Many people don't speak Russian um, or until they were forced to, but they speak more Hungarian, if anything. They identify entirely as Hungarian, yet they're in the same country as people in Donbass who perhaps ethnically are Russian, speak Russian at home and, you know, feel more attached to the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union. So you have these competing identities, you know, on the poles of the country, but even, you know, dispersed throughout it, you have multiple multitude of mixed nationalities and identities. Um, one of my um, interviewees told me once that there's over 200 different nationalities represented in Ukraine. Again, that's a figure that they quoted. I, I don't know if that's true or not. And we don't know this either because the last sentence in Ukraine was done in 2001. <laughs> However, um, you know, I wouldn't challenge that so much in that it is much more multifaceted um, than simply Ukrainian or Russian, as we typically um, survey people and assume it to be. Um, even especially, you know, in the other borderland areas, if you go, um, you know, south of Ukraine, by Odessa, you also have people who are you feel attached to Moldova in certain ways, or at least linguistically have influences. 
Um, Romania also plays a significant role in that the borders change there many, many times. So people living on both sides of the border between Ukraine and Romania um, identify with each other's countries. Linguistically, you have them different Surgic versions or mixed languages you know, spoken there. Cultures are very much, um, you know, a multitude of other influences coming together. So I think with that, um, you know, that shapes or at least illustrates kind of what Ukraine looks like. And it's not simply about, you know, one Ukrainian identity. If you ask someone in Lviv, what is Ukrainian identity? They tell you one thing, um, you know, probably in a very pure Ukrainian dialect. And then if you went to Kiev, you know, someone also in what they say is Ukrainian, um, which also probably has more English and Russian words influencing their dialect, um, would say to you something very, very different. Um, um, it's still Ukrainian, it's still identity. Um, but that's also not um, uncommon in the international system in the contemporary day. And I think we forget this when we talk about nationalism and identity in Ukraine, is that we want it. And for some reason, we're obsessed with trying to have one true version of what is Ukrainian identity, and that if it's not Ukrainian, it must be Russian. But yet we forget that in other countries all over the world, we have local dialects, we have local understandings, we have different regional nuances. I mean, in England, we have the North and the South. We know that there are differences between someone who lives in Manchester and someone who lives in Bristol. We know that this is true, but yet for some reason, it's not emphasized in the same way that we almost obsessively talk about Ukraine and Ukrainian identity as mm. you know, not being Ukrainian enough and it must is too influenced by Russia. Um, as a Canadian, I can tell you there are many, many different nuances across the country and a Quebecois would be insulted if you told them that they were the same, you know, as a Saskatchewanian. Like there are these differences um, that are should to be celebrated and are celebrated, but that I think when we approach the state from the top down and only focus on, you know, these, these old narratives of Ukraine being part of the Soviet Union and Ukraine being split between the East and the West or Ukraine being a borderland, we really fail to recognize what is the local reality. And this is really coloured as well, isn't it, by political intent. It's coloured by the propaganda narrative that somehow Russian was suppressed. Uh, and, of course, the absolutely absurd assumption that if you are a Russian speaker, and that is your primary language, and you're, you, know, you, you, you have a rich immersion in Russian literature, then somehow you would want to be ruled by Russia. I mean, this is the absurd conceit, which, as we were talking before we hit record, many of the media still repeat this absurd fallacy. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't disagree with you by any means. Um, this is something that many scholars have been pushing back against. There's much data that suggests this, especially since 2013, 2014, you've seen a growing number of ethnic Russians and Russian speakers who hold Ukrainian citizenship, who live in Ukraine, uh, who are identifying with the Ukrainian nation, who are upholding Ukrainian cultural values, who are working towards speaking more Ukrainian in their everyday lives. I mean, I've interviewed many, many people in Chernihiv, which was typically a Russian um, oblast, especially the city of Chernihiv. It used to be quite um, a center for retired Russian military officers. Um, so it was quite ethnically Russian. It was also a significant Russian speaking population. However, since 2013, 2014, the number of individuals who said to me they've been actively trying to only speak Ukrainian in their everyday lives is astounding to me. You would not expect that based on, you know, polling previously or even, you know, old census data. However, it shows that people are actively trying to change and they can change, right? It's not the static image of a country uh, that once was and therefore will always be. Um, it has been changing, even though we have haven't recognized it. I think that's, you know, that's where the challenge comes, regardless if it is propaganda or even just ill-informed opinions. I think that, you know, elevating the Ukrainian voices is so important at this time to show us what is the local level, not what we assume it to be based on, you know, these old ideas about the country. And of course, this changes from economic factors, but fundamentally, one of the biggest changes we've seen also coincides with Russia's shift from being a I don't want to use the word benign neighbor because it probably never has been, but from being a, a neighbor that is more reliant on soft power rather than hard power to interact with its neighbors, um, to overt aggression. And I say that in the full knowledge that Russia has, you know, even prior to 2014 was weaponizing energy, uh, was clearly involved in significant active measures within Ukraine to try and make sure that the political establishment uh, aligned with its view of the world. And that's, you know, Maidan and going all the way back, uh, I think probably post-independence, there has never been a period where Russia hasn't tried to meddle significantly. Um, but the real change came last year. And do you see in your surveys 
big shifts in perception and the way people describe identity that correlate with the aggression. So the polling or one of the public opinion polls that we have um, is it used similar questions that were asked in February 2021, December 2021, February 2022 before the invasion, and then May 2022 after the invasion. So we do have some data in which we can um, follow the same questions or similar questions based on you know how they've had to be changed because of the invasion. Uh, with this, we see, I mean, a growing um, understanding or at least um, consensus across Ukraine that, you know, the aggression was caused by Russia, um, the Russian regime or the Russian leadership, and then by Russian people after that. Uh, whereas before, the, you know, there was still this sentiment, but it seemed to be a little bit less and that there was conflicting opinions about you know, different ideas, whether this be um, Ukraine's president playing into politics with Russia, um, possibly about um, Ukraine's desire to join the EU, um, etc. But growing or since, or sorry, since uh, the invasion, we do see this growing consensus across Ukraine that this was caused by the Russian regime and then next by Russian society. Uh, we do see a stronger or a growing support or I guess a growing prevalence of people identifying with the Ukrainian nation, feeling um, attached to the, the civic understanding, regardless of their language, regardless of their ethnicity or their placement within the country. I mean, this makes sense um, because there is an invasion, but also especially because the regions that have been most affected are those that border Russia. So therefore, typically ethnically, ethnic Russians live there and the Russian speakers are living there, but yet they've been the ones who've been most affected by the conflict itself. Uh, so it does make sense why they are feeling more attached to the, uh, the state. There's also been growing sentiments and attachment or support for the president of the country, which for those of us who uh, are political scientists and have studied the president and are, um, you know, been following him for several years, uh, that is quite an interesting finding, I think. Um, I mean, it makes sense in the times of war having, um, you know, unified country behind a certain leader is really important, um, but he has had and maintained significant support through this all. Again, this does speak a lot to his own PR strategy and uh, his use of social media. But in any case, um, I think much of the, the Western world will speak and commend uh, Zelensky. And I think the Ukrainian population also demonstrates this. Um, and then finally, I think the most um, some of the most interesting findings we've seen is just the desire for Ukrainians across the country, despite ethnicity, age, or even war effectiveness, uh, their desire to protect their territorial uh, integrity and political autonomy, despite anything. Um, I mean, in the survey that we ran in July, uh, the strength at which Ukrainians would not negotiate <laughs> over anything, they were not willing to negotiate. I think the only thing or the only little bit of movement we've been able to find around where Ukrainians would negotiate is around humanitarian concerns, um, specifically around corridors and being able to create um, humanitarian corridors. This is really important. And if we think back to last summer, uh, in spring, we saw several humanitarian corridors that were bombed and attacked by Russia, especially around Mariupol and Kherson as we are moving people out of the country. And so I, I do understand why Ukrainians would be willing to negotiate on ensuring that you know their civilians can get out safely. Um, beyond that, you know, there are there is very firm support um, against, I suppose, uh, any sort of concessions, um, any sort of negotiations over territorial sovereignty, um, and especially over political autonomy. And this is going to be probably an impossible question to uh, answer, but it's something that some of my speakers have hinted at. Um, but it's quite a loaded question, and that is, we've seen a flowering of civil society development in Ukraine. We and 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 Maidan was a big trigger, especially for you know younger generation who are now today's sort of politicians, journalists, etc. Um, is there a big difference, or is there a gradient of involvement in civil society the further east you go, with it going down? Um, or is that really not the right way to look at it? Because, of course, a lot of people will come from, say, Donbass and others. And if they want to get involved in, in civil society, they'll probably move eastwards to Kiev, et cetera, where all the action is. But is there a sense of, you know, greater civic society involvement, greater pressure in, say, judicial reforms, et cetera, in a kind of gradient from from west to east? Or is that not a helpful way of thinking? It's really hard to know because it, the conflict is so dynamic. Um, what we do know um, is that in Western Ukraine, you have many refugees from all across the country. So you have kind of an over, 
in some cases, it's actually over, villages are overflowing with people. They've doubled or even tripled in size and their capacity in many ways is, you know, more than, um, or this population is more than what they have capacity for. But you still have people from all, all areas of the country be very active there. In other places, which I think is quite interesting, is you have people who are so tied to their locale that they have only moved to the closest safe place, but also so that they are still close enough that as soon as their place of resident is liberated or safe enough for them to return, they will. So you see this a lot in Kiev is that there's many people from Donbass and from the areas that have been um, under occupation, especially we saw this with Kherson, is that as soon as those places were liberated, those people were the first ones on the roads back to uh, their homes. This shows us that people, you know, they they are attached to the local level. They do want to support the war effort. Um, you know, they are not abandoning their country in any way, but that they are just going far enough that they are safe. I don't know if that tells us necessarily what they're doing for the war effort, but it does show something um, in terms of their attachment to their country, their willingness to defend, perhaps, um, their willingness to be part of this movement. Um, and if anything, I think it also counters many of the Russian narratives that people living within these areas want to be part of Russia because they really want to live where they were living prior to the 24th of February. Uh, absolutely. And in the first instance, they want peace. But in the second instance, they don't want the sort of convert, uh, coercion and sort of uh, mafia style uh, governance that, that that clearly you know has emerged in the occupied territories. Well, the last sort of area of questioning, and you're right, I mean, we could probably have two or three conversations at least just on the topics that we sketched out before before speaking. But the last area I think is that your research, and this is entirely hypothetical because it would never happen, but if Putin had received a little brown dossier with your research in it, it may well have told him that actually an invasion was doomed to fail. Uh, so the question really is, what information was he receiving and why is this entire you know, vast invasion with, with huge numbers of troops and resources, which, which we only has comparison to, you know, since World War II, um, what information and fallacies and mythologies was he really basing this on? Because it, it bears no resemblance to the groundwork that you've been doing. I think... And maybe it's not so much what information was he receiving as so much as what information was he missing. And I think that Putin was not alone um, in missing a lot of important information. I mean, I'm not to say that, you know, I had all of the information that was needed to stop an invasion, um, nor that, you know, this would have helped even the West, you know, prepare in such a way. However, there were things that I've seen um, prior to the pandemic that I was very certain and Ukrainians on the ground were very certain that something of this um I don't want to say magnitude, but something of this um, type or sort would happen in the future. Um, Ukrainians along the borders in many different places, not just on bus, were preparing for um, some type of invasion. They were very scared that this would happen. They knew exactly, and I heard I have many, many stories of Ukrainians who had told me exactly when Russia will invade, this is the route that Russia will take to get to Kiev because that will be their aim, which we saw in the first three days and the whole narrative around, you know, Russia trying to take Kiev in the first three days. Um, with that, I think that, you know, what was missing was these local grassroots understandings. Had we asked Ukrainians what they thought, regardless of this is a hypothetical or, um, you know, just their fears, I think this would have been important for everyone to take into account. And I really don't think, you know, Russia was thinking about how prepared Ukrainians were, um, where his information was coming from, I don't know. But I, I do believe that he believed um, that Ukraine would not only be easier to take, but that Ukrainians would want to come to Russia. And I, I think part of this does come, obviously, from some naive views, but from um, the fact that Ukrainians and Russians did have a stronger relationship before 2013, 2014. Uh, many Ukrainians went to Russia to work. You had many families move in between the two countries. There were strong ties. Very much a soft power role was there. That border that stood between them really was seen in the way that it was seen during the Soviet Union, where it mattered but it didn't really matter. So it wasn't until after 2013, 2014, where Ukrainians were the ones who were pulling away. And I think in Russia's mind, whoever 
whoever it is who is informing Putin's views, um, really not only disliked that, but also believed it would be easier to pull Ukrainians back. And, you know, trying to do that with soft power means wasn't working. So a little bit more of aggression um, started to work. And I think we've seen that, you know, historically, that's what Russia does. You know, it uses force in order to kind of subdue its subjects and however they need to be subdued. Um, but this time, I think, you know, the piece that was missing in all of this story was that y Ukrainians' views were not taken into account. That uh, Maidan was just the beginning. And this, yes, it showed how hard Ukrainians were willing to fight, but it really did not show how hard Ukra Ukrainians were willing to fight. And had you asked Ukrainians, I mean, in 2020, like I had, you would know how hard Ukrainians were willing to fight. And I think, unfortunately, uh, maybe fortunately, I'm not sure, uh, you know, Russia missed this, but unfortunately, the West also missed this. And I think this is a really important story is that had we been listening harder to Ukrainians, um, you know, they would have been much more prepared when this would have happened. And I think there are potentially because I've spoken to General Hodges, who knows people who've been training Ukrainian troops. So those who have direct contact, those who've been actually, you know, passing on the sort of NATO expertise, etc., they were they were absolutely you know one ukraine will not fall in 3 days two they will fight to the the very last person etc so those attitudes could have been discovered by speaking to the right people but these big geopolitical narratives are placed onto the situation um and that continues i think people will be arguing for many years uh about the causes of the war and I think there's a danger, isn't there, of putting more rationality on people's decision making um, that, you know, if you want to look at the big macro scale, you could say, well, this is a clash of civilizations. This is, you know, this is inevitable because of NATO doing blah, 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 blah. In reality, you've got an aging dictator who probably has cognitive decline along with a physical decline. He's got really poor information. He surrounded himself with sycophants. He's got agents in Ukraine who are telling him what he wants to hear, including the oligarchs. And he's just got terrible information combined with, uh, you know, the mythologizing approach to, to history, which is adopted there. And an intense paranoia of needing to increase his popularity figures. Uh, you know, if you come and put forward the idea that this much suffering, this much horror is accidental and it's just someone doubling down on their original mistake, that's not so attractive, you know, in an academic sense or political sense, is it? And yet it might reflect the reality. Yeah, I think the longer the war goes on, right? Um, why, why give up? Why stop? Right? And I mean, I'm not said dictator. Um, and I don't understand and I will never understand, you know, what goes through his thoughts. And I don't think anyone will ever understand. Um, but with this is coming from his position at this point, so much has been lost on his side, reputationally, that that for him is more important um, than any of the losses. And we know that the loss of human life does not matter to um, Russia in the same way that it does matter in the West. Uh, and so that's really important uh, for us to remember is that sending more troops, mobilizing more, you know, more destruction in Ukraine means nothing at all. There, that's not a negotiating point. Um, and that's also the challenge of why trying to come to terms and how we can end the war is th these don't these things don't matter, even though they matter so much to us. Um, and so with that, you know, how do we negotiate um, what what happens? I mean, I'm not even going to try to answer that question. Um, none of us can. Um, but I, I think it does. It speaks to so much. Um, and also the mythology is so important is that these ideas for us, they're myths. But I do believe that they are not so they're more than myths to um to many Russians, but also to the propag propagating machine, um, even to Putin, is that these are fundamentally ideas that you know, have worked in the past, and this time they're not working. And I think the, the harder you push, the hope is that in his mind, this will work again, because it's always worked before. Uh, but this time, I think it is different. And being that leader to lose or to, for that myth to crumble, um, that sucks. And that's mm -hmm. that's a hard place to be in. Uh, so he's very much between in a rock, between a rock and a hard place. Um, and the challenge is so are we. And so we're <laughs> we need to figure out what we're going to do. And I think that's yeah, that's sort of where we're at right now. Yes, I think he's gone from myth to cult. And once you get into the cult-like thinking, it's it's all or nothing, isn't it? You've got to go all in. And I think what we also miss, because we are layering on our moral judgments because what russia is doing is so terrible 
And because we think of it in a, a sort of economic, political, rational sense to an extent, we must assume that this is universally bad for Russians and Russia. Whereas in actual fact, what Putin has realized is that his society is relatively stable. Um, he has managed to increase totalitarian control without triggering revolution. Um, his economists who are world class have managed to keep the economy ticking over. They've got grey imports. They've still got income coming through. I mean, it's it's not great, but they are managing to um, use the revenue from the military industrial complex to keep most of the apparatchiks on side, the educated engineers, middle classes. Either they fled or they've got a role in this new militarized economy. He's probably realizing that actually, you know, for him, um, yes, he's paranoid, but it has not destroyed his regime. In some ways, he's consolidated his power. I yeah, I can't disagree. I think that I mean the challenge will be how long can it be sustained? Um, I mean, we've seen wars you know endure for many many years um across the across the world so with that i think that's the challenge is you can he can he endure will it be civil society that pushes him out um at some point that that's what our hope is as political scientists is that eventually you'll see some sort of revolution or at least there will be so few men or soldiers left to mobilize um, and their families will rise back and push against the regime I mean, we haven't really seen that. We have seen this to some extent so far, but again, any research in Russia can either not be trusted or it's hard to do because we don't really know, you know, what is happening. It's sort of a black box for most of us. Um, but the hope is that there will be something that sort of pushes through and pushes him out. Again, you know, years and decades of KGB type style politics makes any um any sort of research challenging, but also, um, you know, any sort of regime collapse, very difficult. Um, and so I don't think that we'll see that, you know, as soon as we would like. But at the same time, thinking about the cult-like thinking, um, I think it's also important um, to realize that that's also on both sides. And so Putin has very much manifested this you know, within Russia and, you know, has this sort of cult. But equally, Zelensky has effectively done that with Ukraine, not wrongfully so, but you now have these very opposite opposing cults, if you will use that term, um, you know, in complete opposition. And so coming to some sort of resolve will be very challenging going forward in that these are standing now so so polar opposite, but the opinions are so black and white. Um, and in some of the conversations I've been in around peace negotiations with um, some officials, what we've realized is that the first few months of a conflict, in any case, is when people are still in a state that they are rational enough to negotiate and that there hasn't been so much lost. But once they actually move from that rational state, they move in they move into a more emotional state once significant losses have occurred, which we are way past now. With that, thinking is black and white. And this is very much what my research has shown is that people will not negotiate like fundamentally full stop. There is no question there. This black and white thinking then is very difficult to overcome in order to have any sort of outcome that is favorable or I mean outcome that is upheld by either side and I think this is you know a challenge and while Zelensky's sort of cult or the work that he has done to bring together the Ukrainian population is a positive force uh, for Ukraine um, especially fighting a war effort it is really difficult also to find a way in which these two sides can then talk across these differences um, and as someone who is interested in peace negotiation or, or at least would like to see some sort of peace however that might look like um on the continent, I think this is really important for us to think about ways in which, um, you know, the two sides can talk across the difference, across their differences, and if there is a way uh, moving mm -hmm. forward. And to address that, and this is definitely the last question, I know we're almost out of time, you've been extraordinarily generous with your time. Peace negotiation, despite all the terrible uh, suffering and trauma, has to be predicated on the idea of at least some kind of trust or building trust, which underpinning it is some understanding of legal framework, rule of law, etc. And this is one of the practical problems we've got here is that Russia is not a rule of law society. Putin is more akin to a mafia boss. I think um, I can't remember whether it was Yuri Felshtinsky or someone. And I was I asked the question of what do you need to read? It was David Satter, actually. I said, what do you need to read to understand Putin? I thought he'd come up with books of, you know, politics, etc. He just said Mario Puzo's the godfather. That is, that's all you need to get inside that mindset. And this is the problem with the negotiations. And I'll add to that as well, because you've talked about 
the emotional mindset of, you know, once you have trauma and suffering, but actually there's an objective angle to that too, isn't it? And that is Ukrainians might have been expecting uh, a Russian invasion. They might have been expecting it to be bad. They did not necessarily expect genocide. They did not necessarily expect child deportations, torture chambers, raising of towns to the ground. If you look at Russian history, if you look at Grozny, then perhaps and Aleppo, then maybe that that should have been expectation. But I'm betting many did not think because, you know, we're white, we're Christian, we're got a lot in common historically and culturally. They will not seek to erase us. And yet, how can you negotiate with people who who behave like that? I, I think, yeah, you're spot on. I don't I do not disagree by any means. I think that you're exactly right. While Ukrainians expected or perhaps thought this could be a potential, I don't think it was ever realized how terrible it could be. Um, you know, maybe there should have been, but I don't think any human mind wants to ever go down that route, nor should they ever go down that route. Um, although if you do look at what has been done, like you said, in many other conflicts, um, what Russians have done, what Russians are capable of, but also what humans are capable of. And we've seen many examples around the world, not just by Russians. And I think that, you know, it's an unfortunate reality that perhaps the worst should have been um, expected or at least prepared for in the case that it were to happen. Um, but then going forward, you know, it's not negotiations, but what is it? Um, and this is a conversation many of us have. What does that look like when the the one side doesn't follow or at least live in within the same world of rationality if, if you will um it, on one hand we can't um we have to accept that russia doesn't you know, follow western international values and the values of you know liberal internationalism um, and that is okay and i think that we need to come in and understand that that is the premise in which we're working with and then try to think of creative alternatives um that might work and this is really a challenge for many of us. And I've been in several conversations where it is fundamentally against what people believe in, but it, I think it is the only way and I don't have the solutions, but I think it will involve some very creative thinking, mm. about what can be done. Um, I mean, proposals of what I've heard could be something like we see, I think, believe it's with Guantanamo Bay and the U S where there's sort of a rent seeking agreement um, in that perhaps Donbass is rented out in some capacity um, to Russia. So that while it is Ukraine's territory, Sure, you can have it. And if people want to live there, sure, that's fine. Um, another option was running, you know, internationally observed uh, elections in Crimea, in Donbass, in other areas that Russia has occupied and asking the people. And if this is observed by the international community and that these are values that we believe, you know, could this be something that, you know, Ukraine accepts as losing some sort of territory? Again, these are hypotheticals, but they're they are these sort of thinking out of the box options that might be the only way forward because we can't impose our Western values on the situation and assuming that this will work because it won't work. Um, but there has to be some way to move forward because on ongoing conflict or I guess eventually um, a frozen conflict is also not productive for anyone either. And we have relationships in many countries that can uh, don't fit the bill of, uh, of of liberal democracy. I mean, Saudi Arabia for good or ill, China, um, which is a you know good old style totalitarian system there with high tech social controls. Nonetheless, you know vast amounts of trade are done, legal frameworks and approaches are found. Um, I think the challenge is that that even totalitarian regimes like those will have an element of economic rationality, which seems to be absent from, from the, the current uh, Russian regime's thinking. It's, it's, it's not even on a different framework. It's on an entirely different planet of values, even compared to other regimes. And uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, we can only hope that Ukraine takes as much territory back as possible and demonstrates extraordinary strength uh, in order to go into a negotiation uh, with a strong hand. Well, the question is too, and I, I mean, it's something I think many conversations like these sort of dance around is, you know, what is the end game for both sides in all of this? Um, I mean, I don't have the answers. We don't have the answers at all. But it is important to ask, you know, what is victory? Is it just returning those borders of what they were prior? I mean, prior to 2014. If so, there's still the question of how are those maintained and how are those sustained going forward? That's that's not victory if 
you know, if you have to put UN peacekeepers there indefinitely, yes, Ukraine is a sovereign state, but its borders are still not recognized by all international actors. And so there's many questions to ask there. And I think that, you know, maybe we're not at that point yet and that we're still trying to push Russia back. However, is that just what we continue to do? Is that what the war is, is just continuously pushing, you know, kilometer by kilometer? Eventually we get to that border and then what happens, right? And I think that this is, you know, a much larger conversation, but it is something that, um, you know, is implicit in all of these conversations is, yes, the war is ongoing, but you know, where does it end? And what What is that ending going to look like? And even if it is Ukrainians winning, what is that winning? You know, what does winning look like? What is the final act of war? And I think, yeah, we don't know what that is, but I think it's really important that we do keep that in the back of our minds, especially when we, you know, cheer for Ukraine and it's, you know, push forward, um, you know, the involvement of the West, you know, what is the aim of of both sides, but especially, you know, the Ukrainian side, what are we, what are we trying to achieve here? Well, I think that's a, a great open question to end with, and it sort of uh, sets up for hopefully future conversations to unpack that. Um, and events will, will color, I think, whatever discussions are had around that for sure. Um, Romani, it's been a huge, huge pleasure. And I've, I've been so excited to sort of speak since, you know, seeing that event in London, um and uh yeah so glad you could join the channel thank you so much for having me this is a great conversation that my, my mind is going <laughs> thank you so much thank you and slava ukraine oh,